Thank you for that introduction. I would like to begin by saying how impressed I am with so many young people filling the hall on Friday afternoon when you could be going somewhere more exciting. So you've given me an enormous challenge to make this topic interesting for you. I also want to thank Villanova and all of those people involved in selecting me for this great honor. I say thank you, I greatly appreciate that. So turning to the topic of influenza and where these viruses come from, the side panel of the uh, introductory slide summarize the whole event. And if you have a, a short attention span, you can just see this one and then do something else. <laughs> because the aquatic birds of the world, the wild ducks, are the reservoir of all known influenza A viruses. They pass through the pig and mix genetically and eventually end up as in humans. As happened very recently in 2009 with the emergence of the so-called pandemic H1N1 influenza virus. And we all know now that the H1N1 pandemic has been declared that the pandemic is now over. The World Health Organization said that this is all finished, that overall the pandemic was moderately severe and the public perception is uh, summarized in the Australian on the 16th uh, of August, the pandemic that never was. The world got lucky. And the scientists are being blamed for overstating the case. And what we've been blamed for is predicting uncertainties. How do we predict uncertainties? And so I want to walk you through why we made this decision to advise government to spend a lot of your tax dollars on vaccine stockpiles, antiviral stockpiles, and to warn the people of the potential. Let me begin by introducing the player, the influenza virus. This diagram shows two kinds of outside spikes, the so-called hemagglutinin, and there are 16 families of hemagglutinin, H, labeled very imaginatively H1, 2, 3, and so on. And so, and the neuraminidase is the N, and also labeled N1, 2, and so on. These are the active spikes that stick the virus to your respiratory tract, that you take the virus down into your lungs and cause the infection. The neuraminidase is an enzyme, a sialidase, that clips the virus, cuts the umbilical cord, and lets the virus come out. These two surface glycoproteins are constantly changing. There is a battle going on all the time between this virus and your immune system. And as a new virus, as the pandemic virus that appeared last year, meets the population, the body makes antibodies, T cell, innate immune responses, to conquer the influenza virus. But the influenza virus in turn makes changes. If you make an antibody to me here, I'll change that spot. So it changes its overcoat and you have another strain of flu. So that is what we call antigenic drift. The second form of variation in influenza is made possible by the segmented genome of eight RNA segments. And the, the virus behaves like two little animals. If we get two influenza viruses into the same cell, in one round of mating, we have 256 different children 
And so this virus has enormous potential of mating and producing all kinds of different offsprings. Yes. That is the difficulty with influenza. And why did we make a mistake about this H1N1, the recent pandemic? It is because of the H1N1 Spanish influenza from 1918. This was another H1N1. It occurred during World War I, the last year of the war in particular. It turns out to be America's secret weapon. And I'll explain that a little more in a moment. It killed between 50 and 100 million persons in the world. And that's what we were worried about. This is another H1. In one, it came from pigs. It looked almost identical. Where did 1918 come from? Why Spanish flu? In fact, this virus emerged in Kansas, somewhere near, near Camp Fuston, in the center of the United States. Why Spanish? Because World War, was, World War I was going on. The Allies didn't acknowledge the existence of the virus. The Germans didn't acknowledge the existence. And so when outbreaks occurred in Spain, it became Spanish flu. And this, the, the transport of soldiers from the United States to the front in Europe was the key to this huge change that was made in World War I. On 29 September 1918, 9,000 doughboys uh, were on board the USS Leviathan and it turned into the ship from hell. So many people died, so many people were sick. The corridors ran with blood and it really was a disaster. This wasn't the first time this had occurred. In fact, the Surgeon General of the United States had gone to President Wilson to say, Let's stop doing this. We are killing so many young men en route to Europe. And President Wilson said, no, we have to continue this. They are dying just as importantly en route as on the battlefield. When the ship arrived in France, there was a 20 mile long group of uh, line of sick people being delivered to the hospital. That's, and this, this is why the uh, virus was considered so dangerous. So why was it American secret weapon? Because the, the virus that the Doughboys took to France blew across to the German side. And the German generals, it's well documented now that the uh, war was not finished by the Doughboys or the new British tank, but by the influenza virus that blew across from the Doughboys. And it absolutely devastated the, the war effort. And so essentially, the, the uh, United States used biological warfare unknowingly to finish World War I. So in 1918, we did, no one stored the virus. No one knew about the virus. And so no one had it stored away in a freezer like we do now. There were no deep freezers suitable for keeping it. But uh, we all worried why this virus was so enormously pathogenic. So several of us mounted excursions. We went to Svelbard and to dig up bodies from the permafrost. And Johan Holton went to uh, Alaska. Johan Holton was more successful than our mission to Svelbard and found enough tissues so that Jeffrey Taubenberger could determine the total sequence of the 1918 influenza virus. 
And we thought that once we know the total sequence, as we do think about knowing the total sequence of the human genome, we'll know everything. We found that once the total sequence was known, we knew very little. In fact, we knew diddly. And, and the decision then had to be made to make the virus, to actually take the nucleotides from the bottles and make the virus. So based on Jeffrey's sequence, one of the first influenza viruses was remade and tested in the high containment facilities in Canada and United States. You might say that what a crazy, crazy thing to do. Why remake that 1918 virus? And was that the one that was escaping just recently again? No, I assure you that it was not. You would all know, and we wouldn't have so many people sitting here today if that was the case. Because when the 1918 was remade and put into macaques, it grew to enormously high titles. And there was an aberrant cytokine activation and severe primary pneumonia and death. Most of the macaques had to be put down because of this severity. This is an enormously severe uh, virus. And what, what was, was happening, happening is the virus was controlling the innate response of the human, and the human was killing itself. <coughs> the monkey was the, the cytokines. cytokines, the toxic cytokines were out of control. And so we know now what the big problems are with those viruses. So where they come from? I gave you the first clues from the first slide. The migratory birds of the world have all of the 16 hemagglutinin and neuraminidase subtypes. And they cause no disease in those wild birds. The wild birds poop the virus out into the water supply and go from the water supply through the pig into human. And we would expect, since there are so many viruses out there, that it should happen very frequently. And I'll come to that. But the, the results of our virus, discovery of viruses in the wild birds, this was the response for most of the people from 1972 to 1995. Who cares whether there's a virus out there in birds that doesn't make them sick? doesn't make anyone sick, is irrelevant for agriculture, for humans, for other than the academics might want to know something about it. But then in 1995, a child died in Hong Kong. In May, one child died. And then before the end of the year, 18 children had been infected and six of them died. And we traced it directly to the live poultry market and then everything changed. Suddenly, there was great interest in those influenza viruses in the wild birds. And now we have our own studies from 76 to 2010 ongoing with ducks, wild ducks carrying viruses south in the fall, shorebirds carrying it north in the spring, and mainly the folks in Holland that have been doing similar work and the, uh, we see that most of the migration patterns are north and south, but there's overlap between the American flyways and the Asian flyways. So, how do we move an influenza virus from a wild bird through the pig to humans? As I mentioned, we would expect this to happen very often because more than 25% of the young ducks going south each year are pooping out flu. So that's a huge amount of flu being put into the waters of the world. So we'd expect it to happen rather frequently. The other point is that the, the big populations of ducks, pigs, and humans occurs in China. And previous pandemics have mainly come out of 
and we look to see some of the features, we find that China has 68% of the duck population in the world. It has more than 40, about 48% of the pig population in the world. And you know that the human population is dead. So they have the three features in Southeast Asia. So why doesn't the virus transmit more easily between the avian and mammals since there are so many out there? It's because there are so many changes required. The temperature of an avian average temperature is about 42 C, mammals 37. The site of replication in the avian is primarily intestinal in humans respiratory. The mode of spread, fecal water, respiratory. And the receptors for the hemagglutinin spike are different, sialic acid, alpha-2,3, or alpha-2,6 in mammals. And to, to make these changes, that is a huge number of mutations or reassortment events required. But the pig sits right in the middle the intermediate host. It's 39 degrees. The site of replication in the pig, the virus can replicate both in the intestine and the respiratory tract. The method of spread from the water to respiratory, and the pig has both kinds of receptors in its lungs. So the pig uh, is the perfect intermediate. And when we look back at the pandemics of the past century, it was 1918 Spanish, uh, we don't know if the pig was involved, we do know that the, the duck, the wild duck donated gene segments. With the Asian pandemic, the pig was involved in Asia, in Hong Kong, as we had more information, a pig, the human, the pig, and the duck were involved in the genesis of these were both milder than Spanish. So the pig, if we look in the influenza viruses in wild birds, the wild ducks, and look at viruses that have moved into the pigs, the viruses in square brackets, 1918, H1N1, then in Italy, in H in 1979, an H1N1 avian again spread to pigs. In China, an H1N1 spread to pigs. The message is H1N1, there are all 16 viruses out there in the uh, wild birds, but H1N1 has some special relationship with pig that we just don't know about at the moment. And, and what are the special requirements? we have to work out. Of course, the human viruses can all go between the pig and the human interchangeably. I mentioned this uh, virus that went to pigs in Europe, the detected first in 1979. That was a major event because it was the avian virus establishing itself in pigs. And one of the my students, Maria Castrucci, showed that it mated with a human virus to give the virus that was the donor, main, the main donor of the current pandemic. If we look at what happened in pigs in the United States from 1918 to 1998, from 1918, the virus went into pigs and then for many, many years, the virus became milder and milder and milder, and there were no vaccines used in pigs. The virus almost disappeared. But then in 1998, something happened. The virus met up with viruses from wild birds, and from then on, it mated with everything in sight. This period of time, 1918 to 1998, the virus was absolutely monogamous. It 
didn't take on new genes after 1998, it mated with every virus it met. So in the United States, the virus that was characterized was a, a reassorted between human, pink, and wild burglar. And getting different gene segments to make the critical <coughs> triple reassortant virus. We now believe that the, the critical issue was the donation of genes from the wild avian species, both in Europe and in North America, that let, let the virus reassort freely. Then somewhere, we don't know where, we had the genesis of the H1N1. The, a, the European virus met up with a triple reassortant from the United States, somewhere in Mexico perhaps, and generated the current pandemic. And this was the response on April 2009. And it was the response of all of the scientists. Oh my God, we, the one that we had no idea that would occur. All of the scientists had been preparing for what we call bird flu, H5N1 <coughs> or H9N2. None of us expected H1N1. We were all caught blindsided. And so we had to rush to make vaccines that cope with the swine flu and what was at the top of our minds? 1918 in Europe, what it had done in the, uh, the soldiers on the Leviathan. That virus, the, the new pandemic virus, spread like wildfire throughout the world. Uh, and by November, there was some 6,000 deaths. And more than half the population of the world virus also spread to pigs, turkeys, cats, dogs, and ferrets. So this is a very, very transmissible virus. The one thing that we have failed to do over the past 20 years is to do surveillance in pigs. We didn't know which, what viruses were out there in any countries of the world, except the studies that we initiated in Hong Kong in 1998, where the, the folks in Hong Kong monthly sampled 526 nose samples from the pig and serial, serial samples. And they found viruses from 1998 to the present time, and could show the ancestors pandemic virus had been circulating for, for between 9 and 16 years and we had not found it because we had not looked. I turn now to the virus that we thought was going to be the big problem for the time, H5N1, so-called bird flu that occurred in Hong Kong in May 1990. This virus emerged in southern China. It spread over 60 countries in Eurasia now. Over 500 million poultry have been destroyed. 500, over 500 human cases, 300 deaths. And it's established multiple centers. The only thing it doesn't do is transmit. Like the pandemic virus, the pandemic virus transmitted within six months around the world. This virus, doesn't know how to transmit from me to you. Thank God. Otherwise, we would have terrible trouble. Where did it start? We know very well where it started. It started in the markets in Hong Kong, where the, uh, the chickens and the ducks and the dogs and everything are all sold together. And we create a condition for 
spread of viruses between species, <coughs> then the duck brigadier spread to the chickens, and the pheasants spread it around. And if we go back to 1996 in Hong Kong, the mistake they had made is that they built high rise, this pink building in the background was the live poultry market. And so that the poultry sellers could keep their chickens or that weren't sold one day to the next. And, and so they weren't <coughs> clean. And those in science would know that we were creating a PCR-like condition where we're amplifying from time to every day. And so the realization now is the, the, these are very dangerous for the genesis of flu. Right inside the door of the poultry market, this has been what you meant if you came through the front door. Chickens, chickens, chickens. Not only chickens, all kinds of flu, uh, all kinds of birds, quail, pigeons. And if you can, this is the peasant behind here, and if you can read the Chinese, I see some can read it. I believe it's, they tell me, it says, beware, the floor is dangerously wet, and it's not just because water is on the floor. So, um, <laughs> that H5N1 virus uh, spread from Hong Kong. Uh, in 2002, it got into wild birds and spread throughout most of Eurasia. And I've already told you that features of it. The uh, nearly two-thirds of those infected die. That's the scary part. Fortunately, it hasn't found its way across to the Americas, although each year some millions of birds fly between Siberia and Alaska. Why it hasn't come across, we don't know. But the agricultural authorities have looked that it has not come, we would know. Um, and it hasn't found its way to Australia. So it's only a matter of time before it does come. So what is going on with this virus at the moment? In domestic poultry in this area of Southeast Asia, the virus is endemic. And it's also being picked up from time to time in 2010 in Bulgaria, Romania, and one of my worrying places is Egypt. So the, the epi curve of H5N1 is shown the virus was starting to decline in numbers 2008, and then it spread further into Egypt. And in 2010, the, the numbers are still climbing. Egypt is one of the great Areas for me. The virus first case was in 2006. Uh, overall, 112 infections, 36 fatalities, and mainly in the Cairo area of Egypt. Egypt was told by FAO and OIE, the agricultural authorities of the world, to use vaccines to use vaccines in their poultry to suppress the, the virus in the poultry to stop it spreading to humans. And they, they, so they bought vaccine from manufacturers in the world, H5N1 vaccine, and they found that three doses of commercial vaccine failed to protect, protect their chickens. And so they, you know, came to us and said, what is going on? And when we took their vaccine and tested their vaccine, and we found that the vaccines that they were using were perfectly efficacious when we tested them in US chickens. So why have they failed in Egypt? We now know it was the maternal antibody coming through the egg from the vaccinated chickens interfering with the immune status of the chickens, so that the vaccines were ineffective. It was suppressing the immune response of the young chickens. And so this is our challenge at the moment, is to how to overcome and what vaccine
vaccines, with DNA vaccines or other approaches, um, circumvent this certain maternal antibody. Let's think a little about the turning back to human vaccines and H1N1 pandemic. Human vaccines for influenza are made in embryonated chicken eggs, 11 days old, Inactivated subunit vaccines are uh, made, purified, and non-adjuvated. The, these are universally available. In addition, there are subunit vaccines that have alum as adjuvant, which are universally available. The newer vaccines used in Europe contain a novel <coughs> adjuvant, MF59, ASO3, or AFO3. This is a squalene-based, fish oil-based adjuvant, which is a superb adjuvant, and will make vaccines available for the rest of the world when we get acceptance in the United States. The other vaccine is a live attenuated vaccine. It's available in the United States. And some of the issues with vaccines is that egg strategy is too old-fashioned, eggs are not readily available many times, and so we have to turn to cell-based, MDCK-based vaccines, the use of adjuvants, and six months to make a vaccine is mm -hmm. way too long. The best we could possibly do after April 2009 was six months make the new vaccine. In the meantime, the virus is spread all over the world. We have got to do better than six months to make a new vaccine. And because we can sequence the influenza genome before coffee in the morning, we can synthesize the hemagglutinin within a week or so. So we have got to start to use new technologies to make vaccines faster. The uh, issue of influenza vaccination, there are millions of doses of H1N1 pandemic vaccine not used. I think the, the basic uh, problem was that the virus wasn't severe enough. Not enough people died. If more people had died, everyone would have screamed for vaccine. And the excuses that we were given were that how safe is the vaccine? It hasn't been widely tested. How do you test a vaccine in humans in the face of an epidemic? The other complaints was the possibility of inducing autism, the mercury dimersal that we use as preservative in some multi-dose vaccines, Guillain-Barré syndrome. These, to me, these are all excuses. The real thing was that that the virus didn't cause a severe epidemic. So turning to yeah. the other strategy for controlling influenza <coughs> antivirals, there are two major families, one that targets the M2 IM channel, the other the neuraminidase, the cyanidase. And th these are both effective strategies. This is what they look like. The oseltamivir or Tamiflu, I think most everyone now has heard of Tamiflu, which is taken. And it's very effective, but you must take it within the first two or maximum three days after infection. Um, I tell you a little side story. Peter Doherty, who gave this lecture a number of years ago, came to me about uh, just when Tamiflu was being first put on the market. And he said, Penny's got the flu and I'm leaving for Australia tomorrow. What am I going to do? I said, get a prescription of Tamiflu. He came back the next day and said, it works like magic. <laughs> and it really does. But you've got to treat the first two the other drug, the other anti-neuraminidase drug, Xenamivir, the Australian Remenza, is actually more effective than Tamiflu, <coughs> but it's orally 
applicable. So you have to get into your lungs. And if you're very sick, you can't do that. So that is just a problem. And so the other family of drugs, uh, the avantadines, are very effective, but we get resistant to rapidly. And so we get resistance to these drugs. The seasonal H1N1 virus that was around before the pandemic appeared had become totally resistant to tabby flu, but it was still sensitive to relenza. The pandemic that we've just had was resistant to amantadine, and the pandemic H1N1 is developing resistance. And so we are developing resistance to our drugs. We have to develop more drugs so we can have combinations as is done with HIV. We know that we will use single-use drugs, we will get resistance. Multi-use drugs targeting different areas, we can continue on. So what were the lessons from the pandemic Influenza pandemics are unpredictable. Which of the 16 will come next time? Will it be five years, 40 years? We don't know which sometime. The thing that we got completely wrong was the severity. And the emergence of an H1N1 virus, while one was still circulating in the world, is something we had never seen before. We all got it wrong. And that although the virus was structurally and antigenically almost identical with H1N1 from 1918, the virulence markers were not there, fortunately. And this virus again appeared in North America, not in the so-called epicenter in Asia. What about the severity? The overall severity was mild. The young people between less than 30 years, the virus caused severe problems in overloaded intensive care facilities, especially in Canada, Australia, and the Southern Hemisphere. So that people point out to me that while we say this is modest, be careful, the young people lost more years of life, almost as many years of life as 1918. And if we didn't have antivirals, and if we didn't have the ability to oxygenate, then it would be much more severe in this particular group of people. The other interesting features was that in obese people who were five times more likely to be hospitalized, and in pregnant women, 5% of deaths when they should make, when they make up 1% of the population. So this virus is still in the world at the moment. And vaccines are available right now. And I strongly recommend the use of vaccines. Because this virus is still replicating deep in the lungs. And we don't know for sure what it's going to do. Will it require some of those changes of 1918? It is possible. So the lessons on the evolution, the 2009 pandemic H1N1 circulated from 9.2 to 17 years, and from phylogenetic analysis, we know that that's true. <coughs> we didn't do the surveillance that we should have been doing in peaks throughout the world. And the other point is that the avian influenza gene segments that were introduced into pigs separately in Europe and US preceded rampant reassortment. So we, we must know what's going on in the healthy pig. And I, I have some trouble with agricultural authorities because they tell me, we are doing great surveillance in pigs all over the United States. not the sick pigs that concern me, it's the viruses that are in the apparently healthy pig that are a 
evolving that will do things in the future. So I am one of the people pushing like crazy for a global surveillance system in the future. So the continuing H5N1 threat is, is also a concern for me. There's been 37 human cases in 2010, multiple epicenters in Asia, Indonesia, particularly in Egypt. I, I tell you on the side, in Egypt we have a we have a postdoc, no a graduate student working in our lab in St. Jude, and we went to I had dinner in his home in um, Cairo. And all of the chickens have been taken off the tops of the houses. And when we went to his living room, there was chirping, chirping, chirping all the way up the stairs and into his living room. I said, what's going on? Oh, people just moved the chickens into the house. They didn't get rid of them. And so that's the, one of the big problems in Egypt. Many of the people are poor. And they, to have a protein source, they move the chickens in. And so that's the problem. Um, we have seen some reassortment between H3 and human viruses and H5N1 with an increase in virulence. Fortunately, there is no consistent human to human spread. But one of the worrying things for me is that the H5N1 is continuing to evolve. And there is one clay family that's gone into my river water farm. This claim 2.3.2. And if this virus gets into the wild waterfowl and maintains it there, we are in big, big trouble. Just to finish up, I want to turn to my friend the duck. The duck is the root of all of the influenza problems. And the duck uh, is largely resistant to influenza virus. It's infected, but it gets no disease. It poops it out into the water. And when we put the lethal virus from Asia into the duck, it makes no it has no disease. Um, and you, most times you don't even know it's there. And so, on the other hand, if you put the same virus into the chicken, it's dead in a couple of days. My colleagues in Alberta have discovered that the chicken lost the rig eye gene during evolution. The uh, forest chicken doesn't have rig eye. The duck has rig eye. And the rig eye initiates production of interferon, one of the natural, naturally produced control mechanisms for flu. And it leads to activation of the innate immune response. And when they transferred the rig eye from ducks to chicken cells, they induced the uh, interfering response. The question is, should we now make uh, chickens, uh, put the rig eye back into chickens and make them resistant? And I would say no, because then we would have apparently healthy chickens pooping out of this virus like the duck does. So while the chicken breeders would like us to do that, I don't think it's a good idea. So looking to the future, and let me finish the talk. Improved biosecurity, eliminating the live poultry markets. In Hong Kong, the pictures I showed you of live poultry markets no longer exist. My wife and I were in Hong Kong about 10 days ago. We couldn't find a live poultry market. They were all gone. The mainland, on the other hand, is still maintaining the poultry markets. The burden of influenza in swine, both locally and globally, we have got to put into place. Virological and serological surveillance, like they do in Hong Kong, is straightforward and that must be done. The genomes of influenza viruses from the reservoir species have got to be established so that we can make predictions of which virus has moved. Now this is my last slide, and here are the riders of the apocalypse saying, that guy gives me the creeps. 
H5N1, and it really does the same for me. <laughs> this virus has the capacity to kill two-thirds of people it infects. If it once learns to spread human to human, we, we have to take it seriously. My other concern at the moment is this tendency in the United States to go into the backyard poultry racing. The rest of the world are trying to get rid of backyard poultry, make them illegal. And what's happening in the United States? Backyard <coughs> poultry farming, green poultry farming with the Muscovy ducks or chickens are the in thing. About two weeks ago, on a Sunday morning, I stopped at the gasoline station to fuel my tank, and there was a rooster sitting in the fence crowing. And so, in midtown Memphis, so how we, we do make some mistakes. We, we, I'm not sure we should uh, encourage this kind of thing. I hope that I've shown you that the influenza viruses in the wild world do contribute to disease in humans. And that there are serious problems still out there for influenza. I encourage you to all take a vaccine shot this year. We don't know what's going to happen. I just acknowledge the Institute, the National Institute of Health and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and the many colleagues at St. Jude, Richard Webby, Charlie Russell, Stacey George Cherry, Paul Thomas, Elaine Gorbachova, Sabrina Barman, my colleagues in Hong Kong, maybe Iqua, Malik Pierce, and many, many people throughout the world, Korea, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, and the WHO Collaborating Network, and the SEERS Network in the United States. Thank you. In terms of the, uh, the um, immune system, innate immune sensors that are in the host, apparently they play a major role in sensing and, and uh, combating this, this virus. But at the same time, overactive response of cytokines can also do the same thing for the host. So uh, how does that balance work? Um, and the other thing is that there are these gene segments, there are many sensors in the cell, and different gene segments are being sensed differently in the, in the host. Sorry, come and tell me, I, I'm not hearing well, so come and tell me the question. I, it's an important question. Does rigamide cause immunity in the host? It, it is not causing immunity. It induces the you know, rigamide signals the production of interferon. Interferon inhibits the virus. So the, the lack of rigamide means that the chicken can't produce the cytokine to control it. The, the innate response is the initial immune response where the body turns on a whole spectrum of cytokines, and so this is one of them. This is only one of the mechanisms. It's not the whole answer. Right. But at the same time, at the same time, uh, the adaptive immunity, the cytokines that get generated in a hyperactive way, like you mentioned in H1N1 uh, pandemic, you had a hyperactivity, and it could be other side of it. This, this, this is the very interesting question. That, that the, on the other, we want cytokine induction, but we don't want too much. Because if we make too much cytokine, then we kill ourselves. So it's a delicate balance that the body has to do to produce 
enough of these cytokines, but not too much. Too much cytokine, and you die like the 1918 folk. Too little, and, and the, 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 the virus has the upper hand. So we, we are looking for strategies to balance these uh, innate responses. That, that's an area for the future. Please. Does anyone know what, why it began in Kansas? This is 1918. <laughs> now I'm trying again. Okay. Does anyone know what happened in Kansas in 1918 to cause that problem? What happened in 1918 to cause? In Kansas. In the end. Why in Kansas? Why in Kansas? The only answer I have, why in Mexico? <laughs> we don't know. Absolutely, we do not know. But it is very, very interesting to me that, again, H1N1 came out of North America. It, it's, we, we don't know the answer at all. It's, uh, maybe there is, you know, I can, can't even speculate on why Kansas or why Mexico. We, we know, we understand quite a lot about how this virus was formed between the European pig virus and the American pig virus, but why, what are the conditions that make it happen? We don't know. We, we're missing about 20 years of information of viruses in pigs. If we had all those viruses, as they have in Hong Kong, we may be able to answer that. Yes, I, I wondered if you would comment upon the contribution of the six other segments to the pathogenicity of the 1918 flu. The, the, the role of the six other, I commented on just the hemagglutinin and the neurobinidase. The real pathogenicity lies in the polymerase genes. The, the, the markers that we do know about or high pathogenicity lie in PB2, uh, PB1, uh, the non-structural, the non-structural, the smallest gene controls the innate response. The, the virulence control is all involved in the internal genes. They, and when it comes to pathogenicity, they all get together to collaborate. So it takes all of them to be pathogenic. And yet, uh, those segments aren't what you're actually monitoring, so. Those, we were not monitoring them in pigs. If we'd been monitoring them, we, we would have had better understanding. My colleagues point out, they, they said, Dr. Webster, if, if we do do surveillance in pigs, will you be able to predict from the hundreds of thousands of viruses that you get which ones can go to humans? And it's a kind of scientific argument. Unless we have the sequence of all of these genes, we won't be able to tell which of the markers that will permit it to happen. And we're getting closer and closer. But it's really a balance between the virus and the host. We know the host genome, we know the influenza genome, and so we have to start to put, the, put it together. And I'm not in my lifetime, but uh, in the lifetime of the young people here, I think we'll be able to predict which ones are important. We do have time for maybe one more question. I see one over here. Uh, I can try without the microphone. Big voice. You mentioned the rig eye gene and its importance for immunity in ducks, which is a very intriguing observation. And a lot of your comments suggested that birds had it, but then lost some, like, like poultry lost it. What's the evidence for that being, um, in essence, primitive for birds and not a derived character in ducks? Very good question, which I, I, I don't know the answer to. It's, uh, it's, we can show that it's involved in, in the 
on production and by analogy, we, we, we say that it's important in protection. But really, we just started to scratch the surface of understanding the innate response and the, the role of interplay of all these uh, cytokines. So your question is well taken. And are you working in the field of innate immunity? No. <laughs> you should be. <laughs> It has happened more than once. I think there are, there are about three or four cases within families. It's quite interesting. It's always on the female side. It's occurred about three times, always in young people, always on the female side. And yes, it does happen. So uh, I, I think there's a lot of influence of the genomics of, in most cases, have been in Asian people. Um, very puzzling, and we, we don't understand. The truth of the matter is we don't understand transmissibility. What are the genes? What are the genes involved in transmissibility? What are the nucleotide changes that will allow it to take place? Um, fortunately, it doesn't do it in nature. We, the scientists have tried to do this, the Centers for Disease Control under their total um, containment, have tried to make these viruses not easy to make. And so it, it's not one or two changes, it's going to be multiple changes. But as, as we know, flu has the ability to bring in a whole gene 